paste a lot of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey everyone, it's Richard here, and I am with Gabe Sang, and we're going to talk about his uh, Ravnica Allegiance Draft deck. Hey Gabe, what's going on? Hey, what's up Rich? And hi everybody. Okay, uh, so doing Friday Night Magic Draft, and just an uh, eight-man pod, and I had one of my friends passing to me. Uh, I was lucky enough to open the Nuts in this draft format, which is, this is Urethal Absolution, which is probably the best card in the whole set. Um, there's nothing I would take over this, unless it was a, a foil mythic or something that was worth $50. Maybe I would take that. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else I would not take. So, I took this in hopes that my friend Eric, who was passing to me, would not take Orzhov cards. Um, Eric, from what I remember correctly, drafts mostly blue-red. He's... Uh, he's more of a control player, um, but he he can draft uh, aggressive real decks as well. Like I've seen yeah. him draft uh, different levels of, de uh, of decks. So I don't know. I'm just taking this because it's the best card by far compared to anything. I barely even looked at the other cards, and there was nothing remotely close. This is the ten out of ten. Um, every other card I took, there was nothing above like seven and a half. All right, the second pack that he passed me, I. Had a choice between Grasping Thrall and Shark to Crab. And normally in this format, I would draft uh, the best card in the second pack and just try to stay out of the lane of the guy passing to me. But mm -hmm. in the rare cases where I take Absolution first, I almost always want to take uh, a card in Orzov or at least Azurius or something like that that can support this card. Because this is one of these cards that's almost must play once you take. Yeah, it's, it's a card that you want to definitely have maximum value for and like build around sometimes yeah this is it's almost a sin to not play this when you draft this uh it's i don't know it's just so much better than every other card in the set mm -hmm. so i ended up taking grasping thrall over shark to crab yep just to stay on stay in my lane and this thing is maybe like a seven and a half out of ten shark to crab being like i have it rated a 8.25 um out of ten but i felt like this is much better in that spot. So third pick, I got lucky and got past Priest of Forgotten Gods, which is probably one of the more underrated cards in the whole set. Mm -hmm. um, in the Grand Prix I just came back from, New Jersey, I got past this uh, third and fourth in both my drafts, and I went 5-1 in draft. I think in the archetype of Orzov, this is probably one of the better cards you could have. I have it rated over 8, 8.25. Um, it's probably a mistake that they passed that to me in that they probably took cards that are much functionally worse and rated lower than what Priest of Forgotten Gods would, would be. So I yeah, feel I was really, really fortunate to get this. And now my mindset after taking this is my front my front three. It's a pretty, pretty solid front three. Um, I want to basically draft an afterlife deck at this point. So pre... Like, Afterlife cards are a higher premium now. Um, I want a whole bunch of afterlife creatures. I want card advantage. I want stuff that's going to keep me alive. Um, aggressive cards are lower in value after I have stuff like this. Yeah. And I just want to go deep into games and beat them with card advantage and beat them with absolution. Uh, at the end of round one, or like inside of the first set of packs I ended up taking um, a few other cards that were like good for my deck archetype which was like stuff like this um, none of these cards are particularly amazing maybe these two are above seven blade juggler and final payment I have this at seven and a half this is about the same so these are good cards that go in pretty much every Orzov deck but nothing like super spectacular uh, I have this transport, which I feel like the more I play with it, the better it is. So I probably underrated it at the very beginning. Um, it's a solid body that, you know, when it's gone, it produces two creatures. Yeah. So that's And they're two flyers. Yeah. So having evasion in a format where there's doesn't appear to be, like, much evasion is a solid, solid card, in my opinion, especially if you can abuse it. Yeah. I feel like Afterlife 2 is, like, massive compared to Afterlife 1 as well. So, like... Basically, like, 
uh, you know, also in this format, it feels like I have more time. If I build my deck correctly, I have more time to build up than I do in other formats where like I'm dead in like four turns. Like I feel like the games just just start developing um, uh -huh. at about turn four or five when, like, assuming I can I can do stuff to to live longer, like cast final payment or something like that. I know I have to pay five, but like if I can kill kill stuff and stay alive. Cards like this are really going to start dominating. Uh, then we went to pack two, and pack two, like, it, it felt like in, in, during pack one, um, the player passing to me, which is my friend, uh -huh. was pretty much playing something in my colors. Because after picking my front three, it felt like a, it slowed down a little bit. I, I know these two two still pretty good cards, but it felt like he was playing something like or, uh, Azorius or something like that, which afterwards, in the draft, I realized he was. So... I had that read correct, but like, there's really nothing I can do at that point. Like, once I take Absolution first, I have to pretty much stay on lane and continue on Orzhov. Um, pack two, because me, Eric, and the person in front of Eric were, were cutting um, Esper colors. I was able to get a whole bunch of bombs, so I got Bell Haunt and I got Hero. These are both above eight. Those are very, very strong cards. I got. Revival and Revenge, which is spectacular when in, in my testing. Um, this card basically gives me like a 20, 20 point life swing a lot of time. Yeah. And it feels like the game is like they can't race. Even when I'm behind, I start start behind and I cast this. Like it feels like they can't come back. And I almost win all the races. I've cast this maybe five or six times and I think I've won every single game in this set. Um. I got some other really solid playables like this. This guy got another final payment in the set of uh, in the set, second set of packs. I feel like this guy is spectacular. This guy's I have rated at 7.5 out of 10. He's probably closer to 7.75. Um, but this is one of those cards I'd really love to have in this archetype. I would probably play like six or seven of these. <laughs> yeah, if you get six or seven of yeah. the uh, of that, you're you're sitting pretty. Yeah, and I finished off the second pack, set of packs with this guy. Um, he came around, so I probably got him tenth or eleventh or something like that. Okay, which was wow, that's super tenth or eleventh. Yeah, wow, that was, that was spectacular. Like, it's like <laughs> such great value. Yeah. Okay. Basically, at the end of pack two, I had I did my my count to see how many cards I usually have, and I had like seventeen or something like that. So you were you were already sitting pretty at that point. I was looking great. Yeah. But I did know that because like I got fortunate in the first set of packs. Mm -hmm. Pack three, um, I was pretty certain I would not get like a mass amount of playables. I was not expecting like eight or nine playables. I was, would have been really happy with five, obviously, because that's all I really needed, and like. That is basically what happened. I do not really remember getting a good card, any really, really good cards in third set of packs. So basically what I got were like a Fiend, a couple of Braid Brands, uh, two underrated guys, I guess. Another another Transport in this Knight, who is underrated for the same reason as this. Yeah. Yep. And I got a Dead Revels, which I definitely wanted because that just gives me more depth. And then I finish it off with these two random filler cards that I would play. So uh, each time that I've seen you play uh, RNA, you're you're developing an Orzov or an Esper type of feel. Do you feel very comfortable with this in the format yeah, right now? The more and more I play Orzov, like it feels like it's a very very good archetype, and my win rates like pretty high with this. I think it's because, like, I draft really, really focused decks. I don't try to draft decks, like, um, they have some, like, defensive cards and then random, like, some ag aggro cards in there. Like, basically, I have no no cards that aren't card advantage cards or, like, the main purpose of the card is to keep me alive. Like, um, a lot of these cards, even the, these ones right here, these combo really well. Like, I'm not sure if you know what this combo does but basically like if i attack with the, my fiend mm -hmm. um and you block with like a five five i can cast this on it this blade brand on it to yep. get a death touch and it can kill not only the creature you're 
you're blocking with when this thing goes to the graveyard and triggers and I can do one damage to any target. It is death touch still, so yep. I can kill another creature. Great little two card combo that yep. can uh, really just uh, get, gain you a bunch of advantage, especially if you have like bigger stuff that can't or smaller stuff that can't get through those big creatures. Yep. So it's really good. Anyways, I just heard the round timer and <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for talking about your uh, draft deck tonight and I uh, look forward to drafting more Orzov in the future. Okay, thank you, Rich. Yep. Bye. Bye.